We're on Daf Mem Vav Amid Beis. And we began the Gemara after the Mishnah on the top of Mem Vav Amid Beis. And we're trying to figure out what is the machlokas here between the first two Tanoim in the Mishnah and Rabbi Yeshua as the last Tana. The first two Tanoim are of the opinion that in this case of Chalat Mea on Yontif, both Rabbi Eliezer and Ben Becerra look for an option, a recommendation to make the Chala and avoid the Iser Bal Yerabai Matzah. Rabbi Yeshua, by contrast, says, I'm not impressed. There is no Bal Yerabai Matzah on Chametz of Chala because Chala doesn't belong to any individual. The Torah says, Lo yira lecha Torah, but the chala belongs to the Kohanim. And therefore, you don't have your own bilus, your own ownership over the chala to generate an Easter by Yerah by Yimotzeh. So why not just simply leave well enough alone, leave the dough that's chala until after Yantif. And after Yantif, when you're allowed to bake it, you'll bake it. I, it became chametz because you didn't bake it. As we said in the last Mishnah, that if you're not osake in the dough continuously, then after 18 minutes, it will ferment to become chametz. He says there's no value of Ayimotse. So the Gemara initially presents the possibility that the machlokas between Rabbi Yeshua on the one hand and Rabbi Laza on the other hand revolves around the concept called tovas hana. Is it mammon or is it not mammon? When the Israel has rights to choose the coin of his choice to deliver the the chala, or in the case of truma of truma, those rights are worth something. He can actually sell those rights on the market. And if there's some individual out there who would like to choose the coin of his choice, he would pay you for you to transfer those rights to him. That's called tovas hanam mama. According to the other view. That's not called moment. You don't really own the chala per se. The goof of the chala is not yours. It belongs to Shevet Kahuna. You have external rights that the Torah gave you schuyot, to choose which coin you want. And maybe those extre- you know, external rights, extraneous rights can be sold on the market. It's worth something. But nevertheless, that doesn't generate ownership in the chala per se. And then Afghamid is going to be in the case of chala shel chametz during Pesach. Is there a violation of Bal Yerah by If I'm of the opinion that the fact that I have the rights granted to me by the Torah to choose the coin that I want to give this challah to, that's called something that gives me mama, that gives me ownership rights in the challah itself, which express itself in the fact that I choose the coin. It's similar, if you will, to a Kenyan kaka leperosa, right? If I own the kaka, only with certain, with regard to certain rights that I can rent out the karka or I can produce fruit and those fruit, that fruit belongs to me. That gives me rights and ownership in the karka itself here too. I have ownership in the dough, in the chametz, because this chala generates my hana, my benefit that I can sell on the open market, that I choose the coin. That's the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer and Ben Becerra, they therefore have to solve this problem and get this challah into the oven to make it before it becomes chametz. Whereas Rabbi Yeshua is of the opinion that tovas hanah ain't a moment. It's a separate schus, independent of my relationship, my ownership on the goof of the challah itself. And therefore, no problem in leaving the challah to ferment and become Chametz, and it's not your chametz, it belongs to the Kohanim. The Gemara then suggested, lo, the Kuli Alm, everybody agrees that Tovas Hanoah ain't a mom. And we pointed out yesterday, it doesn't mean that you won't find the Tana somewhere in Chas who maintains that Tovas Hanoah is mom. That's a major machlokis Tanoim. It's no get to Kedusha, where you can be a Kaddish and Isha with Tovas Hanoah, etc. But in this context, with regard to Mishnah, it's very possible, says the Gemara, that everybody, even 
Rabbi Eliezer and Ben Sera agree that Tovah Sana ain't no mama. And then the question becomes, why is it therefore that according to Ben Sera and Rabbi Eliezer, there's a problem here. If he allows the dough to rise, he'll violate Bali Rabbi Matzi, and therefore he's compelled urgently to bake the challah. And the Gemara answers, Hoil. And that's where we ended yesterday. So let's see if we're all together on the same page. And we are now counting down from the beginning of the Gemara, which is itself thir- three lines down. We're going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, six lines down. Lo, the Kuliyama, Savri, Tovasano, Enomam. With regard to Mishnah, we cannot commit anyone to hold the Tovah Sanoa's moment. The problem here of Chameitz, which is a serious problem according to the first two Tanoim in Mishnah, is because of Hoyl. And the Gemara says, Hachaba Hoyl Kamiflugi, the Rabbi Eliezer Savar, Amrin and Hoyl. And Rabbi Yeshua says, Law Amrin and Hoyl. What is Hoyl? Hoyl, the Gemara says, Viboy Itchal. Ale. What it means is that hafroshas chala is a neder. It's something that you declare, and it has the Allah of haflas peh. Once you declare harezu chala, like any neder, you can rescind that chala and revoke it by going to a chacham and ask you to be mater neder. So that what generates the shame chala in the hafrasha is the neder and the declaration that this is chala. Hoel tells me that whenever I look at chala and analyze it, I always have to consider the possibility that down the line it won't be chala. Meaning that the bailim have the right to be shoel and revoke the status of the challah as challah, just like they can revoke their own nidorim. By going to a chacham to get a hetar nidorim, they can do that with regard to challah. And therefore, even though at present moment, they have not exercised that ability to go ahead and appear in front of a chacham and be shoel on the hafrosh's challah, but nevertheless, we have to consider the possibility that they might do so. And perhaps what the Gemara is trying to point out here is that in the context of Hoyl, I must consider the ownership rights of the Bailim in this Chal. You might ask, well, what do you mean ownership rights? Tovas Hanoyin Mama. This Chal belongs to the Kohenim but does it really belong to the Kohen? If you would tell me that it irre- irreversibly it belongs to the Kohen, and that's one thing. Then you could say that Sheva Kahuna acquires absolute ownership. But when you have an ownership that can be rescinded, that's not really ownership at all. On the contrary, it's the Bailim who are mafresh the Chala, who in truth own the Chala, and I'll prove it to you. If they don't own the Chala, meaning if the Afrosh itself would be a Maisa Kenyan, of Havaris Bailus, in which or through which they transfer ownership to the to the Kohanim, then that has to be irreversible. The answer is that we're not talking about Hakna. The Afrosh itself, up until the actual delivering of the Khal into the hands of the Kohanim, is only a middle state. It's a quasi ownership on behalf of the Kohanim, because maybe at the end of the day they will receive. And the Bible will follow through with the challah, but he may not. And since he still has the power of Sha'il, it means what, what, what is the Hafrash effectuate? Nothing more than an Edra. If it was beyond an Edra and it was a Kenyan Haknot to the Kohanim, in which the Bailim lose their, they forfeit their ownership rights to the challah, that would be a reversal. There would be no possibility. For example, if I sell you my cow, I can't go to the greatest Chacham, the chief rabbi and ask him to revoke the sale of my cow. The sale of my cow is irrevocable. But in the case 
of Chala, it is in fact revocable, which proves that we're not dealing with a Kenyan like a Paro, which I give to you and you now I test the ownership, you become the proud owner of the, of the cow, but rather it's in the Torah, it's in the realm of Nidorin. It's more of a pledge and a commitment that this particular piece of, of Kikar will be given to the Kohen. That's a fine commitment. And I respect that on a moral basis. But on the other hand, it's revocable. You can go to a Chacham, you be show it. Therefore, when we get to the issue of Bal Yerobah Imotzeh, and do you have ownership on this Chala, which is Chametz, according to this opinion of Hoil, which is that of the first two Tanoim in our Mishnah, you will be in violation of Bal Yerobah Imotzeh. Unless you can bake this Chala before it becomes Chametz, if you allow it to settle as it is and become Chametz, you will violate Bal Yerobah Imotzeh. I, you are mafreshit. And Tovas Hanoi ain't no moment. The answer is okay, Afrosh is fine. It's a very nice uh, gesture on his part that he designated this particular Kikar as Chala. But nevertheless, he hasn't forfeited his ownership on the Chala. It still remains his. And the proof of the pudding is that he can be Shoel on his Afrosh's Chala. It's therefore, says the Gemara, Hacha Bahoel Kamithligi. Rabbi Eliezer, Savar, Amrin, and Hoel, Viboy, Itchel, Alei. Since he can be shown the Chacham on his Afrasha, and the Chacham will be Oker, his Afrasha, is therefore the Chal will go back to being Tevel, like it was before, and it belongs to the Israel, is therefore Mamono, even now. He violates by Yerobah Yimotze. This Chal is considered his Mama. And therefore, Rabbi Eliezer advocates that he postpone being mafresh the challah and leaving it to become chametz. And therefore he says that no, he's going to have to bake it immediately and then it'll be mafresh the challah. But Rabbi Yeshua Savar, lo amrin on ho'il. Right now, as is the challah, is mom and kohen. It belongs to the kohen. Once he was mafresh it, he has taken it out of his rituals. He no longer will be in violation of Ayur Abayi Matzah. And therefore, let him be Korei Shem Chala, even before he bakes it, that he can leave it without a fear. And instead of baking it, let it become Chometz. It's not his. Now, we want to make a few, a few points over here. First of all, you may recall yesterday that we raised another possibility here. The Mishnah addresses this predicament of Chalat Meah on Erev Pesach, on Pesach itself, from three different perspectives, three different recommendations. We offered what seems to be the most simple recommendation, and that is Bittel. Let it be Mavatel. Let it be Mavatel the the Chalas Chametz, and after Bittel, we had already the Gemara at the beginning of the Perik, but Bittel Baal Masagi, according to the Torah law, all you need is Bittel, and Bittel, or Hefker, for example, will take it out of your possession. Why doesn't the Gemara offer that as a possibility? And the answer that we, we suggested yesterday in the name of the Shagas Arye was that Bittel is only possible when you own something. Here, the chala belongs to Shevet Kahuna. It's not yours. And you cannot be mavatel or be mafkir the chala. It's not yours to be mafkir. Ah, you'll ask me, but Rabbi Eliezer holds that you violate Balyeroa and Balyemotze. If I start, we see from that that you do own the chala. So why can't you be mavatel it? And we have to draw the following conclusion. And this needs careful, careful analysis. That on the one end, you have enough ownership, according to Rabbi Eliezer, to violate Balyura by Yimotze, despite the fact that it's Mom and Cohen. But number one, we know that you have Tovah Sano. And number two, we know that you have the ability to be Shoel on your Afrasha and revoke it. That ownership is enough to violate Balyura by Yimotze, but not enough 
to facilitate Bittel and Hefker. This is a briskest tzvei dinim here on both sides. What is the nature of your bailus according to Rabbi Eliezer? Let's not carry this too far. Although Rabbi Eliezer insists that you will violate Bal Yerah by your mother, it is considered l'cha, that does not mean that you have full bailus over And I'll give you an example of this. For example, if let's say Ruvain is mafkid, his chametz deposits it in my possession, and I am a shomer, I am responsible to guard his chametz, I will violate by your Yomotzeh, even though it's clearly not my chametz. The answer is that since I have a chrayus, that a chrayus is enough of an ownership to engender a violation of your Yomotzeh. And where is the paradigmic statement in Chazal that ownership for Ba'i Rabbi Motzei is not equivalent to standard ownership, classic ownership in Kol Tarkula. That's a statement of Rabbi Lozar back on Davov of the days. Eino Bershusa shall Adam the Asan Akosov Ki Iluhein Bershusa. So the Torah made it as if it's yours. And Rabbi Yezer holds that in a case where you have Tovah Sadna, or you have the potential of being Shoel on the Chal, on the Frasha, this gives you enough bailus to violate Bal Yerubim So within the context of that separate bailus, that unique lecha of Bal Yerubim, that is sufficient. You have violated Bal Yerubim On the other hand, for Bittel and Hefker, that you need full-fledged bailus. That's classic Hefker of Kol So therefore, our Gemara never suggests an alternative solution to the problem of the Chalas Chameit, let him just be mafkir. The answer is he cannot be mafkir. As far as Hefker is concerned, in classic ownership rights, he does not have ownership. The ownership that he has, according to Rabbi Eliezer, is a partial ownership, which fulfills the requirement of Lecha, as far as Bal Yerob is concerned. So it's a unique bilis of Chameit for that, for that Averu. But now, we have to ask a different question. There's a tosis in the first parak that says that Masha Chometz al Menas Levaro eno over Mishum Bal So, for example, if I find Chometz in my possession on Pesach, oy vavoy, I didn't do a good bedika and I missed a major piece of, of Chometz. So the Gemara says, in that case, I cannot be mavato lechametz kofol of sakli. And the question is, what happened to Bal Yerob So Tosis of the opinion that's called Masha Chometz al Menas Levaro. He is holding on to chametz, but for what purpose? Because he wants to destroy the chametz. He can't do so on Yontif. Because let's say Bir Chometz al Shreifa and Shreifa is an Av Molacha. It's Havara le. Uh, what do we call it? Le, right? So Avar is one of the Malachas. And Tulsa says, you know what? He doesn't want this Chomet. If we're up to him, if his hands were not bound, he would destroy this Chomet. But I can't be Mavatul, it's after Shasi Suro. I can't destroy it because it's a malach of Havara on Yontif, and it's not L'tzor Chochol Nefesh. Therefore, I'm waiting for my first opportune moment to destroy the Chometz. Let it be after Yontif. I make Havdolah, and immediately I destroy my Chometz. Tosa says in that case, Masha Chometz, he retains the Chometz in his possession. al Levaro, because he wants to destroy it. Right now, he can't destroy it. Is Eino over all of the Balyro Bayimots? That's not the ownership that generates the Easter of Balyro Bayimots. You want to destroy it and your Masha Chavit Samanasli. How do we square that Tosus with our Sugya? With the exception of Rabbi Yoshua, the Tanoim agree, and if he allows this Chalas Chavit to ferment and he doesn't bake it immediately before it rises, he will violate Balyro Bayimots. Rabbi Yeshua says, wait till after Yantin. Okay, fine. The Gemara says, the Rabbi Yeshua says, you'll wait till after Yantin because there's no Bali Rabbi Matzeh because Tomas Anoy in a moment and he doesn't accept Poil. That's all fine and dandy. 
But how could the other Tadmayim in this particular situation reject Rabbi Yoshua, who advocates leave the dough as is, and if it rises, it rises, so, so be it. There's no value of Rabbi Yimotzeh. Of course there's no value of Rabbi Yimotzeh. Because he's Masha Chamei, 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 After Yontif, he's going to destroy the Chamei. So this is a kasha which I can't answer. And Belineda will try to research it. This should be a case of Masha Chamei, Chamei, Now, I just want to point out that the Achronim got a town over here with this Tosus back in the first parak. Again, we're not learning the first parak, so I got off easy. But in the first parak, they claim that what Tosus means when he says that Masha Chavitz Amanas Levaro, you know, overall by Rabbi Motze, he doesn't mean to say that the Torah doesn't recognize the Avera. There is an Avera here. The Torah may alleviate you from Malchus, let's say, for. You know, there are certain situations where you might get malchus for violating by your rabbi mutz if you do so actively. But if you're masha chavitz almanas levaro, then we're going to alleviate you from malchus. But in Issa, there certainly is. If you go with that mahal, then we can square very beautifully with Al Gemara, because Al Gemara wants to get rid of this, wants to prevent the process of getting chavitz here at all costs. And the reason for that is because Masha Chomet Salmanas Levaro is at least a violation of the law of Balyur Abay Motsi. It might not be a full fledged violation with a Chiyuv to generate a Chiyuv Malkus, but it definitely is, is an Averu. Now, let's ask another question here. We're worried about the following that. This chametz, if you leave it as is, this dough is going to rise, it'll become chametz. And according to one shita, which is Rabbi Eliezer's shita, there's going to be a violation of Balyar Abay Why? Why is there no option of of appointing a shliach to be mafresh the truma, and then once the shliach accepts his mandate, his mission? Then we solve the problem of Balyur Abayimotze. Why? So let's go back one step. The Gemara says in the second interpretation that the problem of Balyur Abayimotze is Hoyo. Hovi boy Itcho. He can undo what was already done and revoke the status of this Kikar as Chal, make it back to Temel. Let me ask you a simple question. Is that right or ability of the Bailim to revoke the Chala by going to a Chacham? Is that the Olam Void? Is that a continuous ad infinitum, right? I'll ask you a simple question. Again, this is something for a, for a, for a uh, first grader. I gave the Chala to the Kohen. Can I be shoyel on the chala after I already gave it to the Kohen? That doesn't make any sense. Thus is impossible. How could it be that the Kohen received his chala and as such, I fulfilled my mitzvah, I delivered the nasina to the Kohen, the Kohen is eating the chala, Betupim ubi mecholos, it's a key of mitzvah of achilas chala. And now I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to be shoel on my chala by going to a chacha. I'm just trying to dramatize that there is a limit. You know, there is a law of uh, a statute of limitation with regard to shoel on, on afrash's chala. Therefore, 
we can now open up a new vista here, a new window, so to speak, a possibility of circumventing Balyura Balyumatse and without having to bake the chal, as Rabbi Eliezer is, is insisting, you know, bake the chal, right? Why don't I just give, why don't I just appoint a shliach? I say to him, here's the dough. You go ahead and be mafish chal. And the moment I do so, I can no longer be shoel on my afrasha. And what logic would compel me to that position, to that conclusion? It's the following. The shliach is now in charge of the chala. A, he is going to be mafrish the chala. B, he will decide how much to be mafrish because there are different levels, you know, of of Beninus and so forth, Ayin Tova, and he will deliver the Chala to the Kohen. In effect, he represents not only the Bailim, but he represents the Kohen as well. And he's operating on behalf of the Kohen. And what, what chutzpah does he have to do so? Because the Bailim appointed him. And what we call Havaris Bailus through Shlichus the Bailim has now transferred over to the Shliach all the rights over this Chal. Now you're going to tell me that the Shliach is going to be mafresh the Chal and the Mishaleach is then going to go to the Chacham and be Shoel on the Frosh's Chal of the Shliach? Yeah, oh, I made a mistake. What do you mean you made a mistake? You come to the rabbi and you say, I made a mistake. You know, I thought it would be easy to stop smoking. So I took a nether that I won't smoke. And now I come to the rabbi and say, I can't, I, I can't do it. I have to smoke. I'm, I'm addicted. But what are you telling the, what are you telling the rab, the chacham, with regard to that frosh scholar when you gave it to a shlia? And he's in charge of that frosh scholar. You could be shoel on, the, on, on that frosh If the assumption is that once he gave the bilus, you know, he gave the sovereign, sovereign control over this hafrasha to the shliach, and that was the nature, the essence of the, the minu shlichus. Then he gave over his bailus over the hafrasha. Kol masha nogel hafrasha zu is in the hands of the shliach. It's no longer in the hands of the bailim, including being shoel on. So the melee, he has no value rabbi Yimotzen, because the Gemara is saying that according to Rabbi Yimotzen, why do we have to urgently bake this challah? And not allow it to ferment to become chametz because hoil, the boy, what's the language here? He boy it shall allay, he could be shoal on it. Why not just tell him to appoint the shlia, get himself a good buddy who's willing to be mafrich chal on his behalf? And once he does so, there's no whole the boy it shall because he can no longer be shoal on his neder. And the Achronim come to an unbelievable conclusion based on, you know, we always say that you learn something from what it says in the Gemara, but really you learn something from what it doesn't say in the Gemara. The fact that the Gemara is completely oblivious and ignores this possible alternative solution to the Valyurabai Matze problem indicates that, in fact, he could be shoel on his Afrosha even after he appoints the Shliach. How so? And the shliach is, after all, the, in the, he's in the driver's seat. He's the balabas on everything that's relevant to this afrasha. And the answer apparently is that since he could be mavato the shliach, once again, we're, we're going to say hoil. As is this chala right now is Mullen Cohen, but we're going to say no, it's yours. Why is it yours? And you're going to violate by Rabbi It's called Rabbi Leza because you could be showing. And now what we're going to say is that even after you point the Shliach, you could still be showing. How? Because you could be Mavato the Shlichus. And as we said earlier, when is the law of expiration? You know, at what point do we say, Ad Khan, you've terminated your ability to be showing on that Russia? 
And the answer is, up until the moment that you gave over the chala to the coin. But in the case of a shlia, we might have suggested that the point of expiration after which you can no longer be chol on your on your hafrasha is the very moment you gave it over to the to the shliach. But the answer is no. The shliach has not yet implemented his hafrasha. And up until that point, you could be mevatel the shliach, you could revoke the shlichus. And therefore, Therefore, it's again holy boy because if you'll be mavatel the shlichus and ipso facto, you could be mavatel or be matir the nedner of the afrash itself. You still own the chal. It hasn't left its status as teva. It still is really teva, even though you were mafrish. Itmar. Let's pick up the Gemara now. Itmar. This is a world-class Gemara about the principle of Ochel Nefesh on Yontif. We're going to address situations in which he prepares Ochel and, and implements a Molocha, but he has no interest in eating the product of his cooking, baking, whatever it might be, on Yontif. He, in effect, is doing this malacha l'tzar chol. Ha'ofer miyantif l'chol, Rav Chizna Omar Loka. And I have no problems with Rav Chizna because the Torah only allowed achash ha'yochel l'chol nefesh, which is called the ochel nefesh of yantif. He has no ochel nefesh of yantif. He hasn't the least interest in eating these breads on yantif. Not even one single one. Rashi points out here that he already finished his Sudas Yantif and he's got some spare time until he makes Havdola. Is it still Yantif? And what does he do? Hey, you know what? I got some free time on my hands. I might as well bake Fachol. I might as well bake, you know, my breads for tomorrow. Why not? Says Rav Chiz, he's going to get Malchus because the Torah only permitted Afia as one of the Malachos. If it's Litzorah Chayon, it's Ochel Nefesh of today. You finish your Suda, you have no room in your belly to eat this challah or this uh, pas, and you're baking it now for the purpose of Chol. That is not an Afia that was included under Ochel Nefesh. You therefore get Malkus. Rav Omer ain't a loke. Why not? So jokingly, I thought to myself, maybe Rabba holds, you always get hungry. You know, you never know when you'll get hungry. But he says it a little differently, Rabba. Rav Chizam aloke, lo amrin and hole, mikloile, orchim chazile. And Rabba amar, ain't aloke, amrin and hoil, mikloile, orchim chazile. Again, he finished his Sudas Yantiv. But you never know which guests might show up. And if the guests show up, says Rabba, you have to feed them a pas that is fresh kebak, it's right out of the oven. And Rabba goes a step further. Excuse me. And he says that even if he doesn't have, <coughs> excuse me, he doesn't have any orchid, right? There, there are no orchid. The whole town has already completed its Sudas Yantu. Nevertheless, the theoretical possibility that Archim will come, you know, Avram Avinu is sitting out there and all of a sudden three Malachim show up. That's enough to consider this Afiyah as an Afiyah L'Tzorich Yantu. The Pele V'chidosh. All the Mikle Le'orch. And Rav Chizda says, what do you mean, since if Archim show up, he'll feed them this pass, and the pass is Ochel Nefesh on Yontiv? What do you mean? He doesn't have any Archim? Right now, he's doing an Afiyah. Are there any Archim? There are no guests in the horizon. So what's the purpose of his baking it? It's clearly L'chol, and it's not L'dor Chayom. 
On that, the Torah says, if you're not taking the Tzorach Hayom, you get Malchus. You violate Malchus Yontif, which generates a Chiyom Malchus. You know, I have a sense that Rabba feels a little bit uh, insecure. He needs to find some sort of kasha, some sort of proof to undermine the position of Rav Chizda and allow for his position, because this concept of oil is as if hashtanami chazile, it's a tzorach yontif and not a tzorach is a bit of a weak position. But says Rabbi to Rav Chizda, and this is almost a naive question, he says him, the amrit lo amrit in oil, is heich ofer mi yontif with Shabbos? Yontif is on a Friday, and I'm baking my challahs for Shabbos on Yontif. How am I allowed to do so? Now, don't ask me how Rabba missed the beat over here. We have what's called an air of Tavshilin. I mean, for this goof, the Rabbanon enacted an entire new enterprise called air of Tavshilin. Somehow, Rabba is oblivious to this. Says Rabbah, according to your Rav Chizda, Maisim Bechol Yom, that when Yontif falls on Shabbos, we bake for Shabbos. And according to you, we should get Malkus for such an Afir because it's not L'Tzor Chayom. Omo Leser, Rav Chizda says to Rabbah, Mishum of Tavshilin. Have you forgotten an entire chapter in Mesech the Beta of that Erev Tavshilin, which allows us to bake from Yontif to Shabbos. So then on Erev Yontif, we gather together uh, what's called a, uh, a Tavshil, together with um, a Kikar, of, we usually use matzah, so you have matzah and a, bait and a cooked egg. And what that means is that already on Erev Yontif, you have started the process of preparing for Shabbos. And on Yontif, you're not starting and initiating a new process, but rather you're continuing what you began on Erev Yontif. And that's not called an Afiyah L'Tzorech Shabbos. That's just a Hemshech of the Afiyah that you began on Erev Yontif. So that's called Erev Tavshil. So now we get to the crux of the issue. Erev Tavshil is a Takhonet Rabbonah. But you told us, Rav Chizda, you taught us that baking on Yontif Chol, or for that matter for Shabbos, is a violation of Molech HaSafir, for which you get Malchus. How could the Rabbanon be authorized through their new enterprise called Erev Tavshilin to undo and undermine a violation of Molech HaDoraisa? Now, there is a very wide Authority granted to the Chacham and Yesh Koch Biat Chacham Lacker Dovim in Torah, so that if Rosh Hashanah coincides with Shabbos, we won't blow the shofar. And if the first day of Sukkot coincides with Shabbos, we will not take the Dalad Minim and the Rabbana are instituting something to be Oker Dovim in Torah. But all that is what? Bishavi Altas. But the Rabbana could not allow you. To violate a Doraisa Isur Bekuvase, they can't tell you to eat this Chalev, that they don't have the rights to do. That's not within the purview of their authority. And now you're telling me that through Erev Tafshilin, which is a Takonis Chachamin, you're allowed to violate the Isur Afia of Ofe Shalolit Tzorech Yontiv, which is a Chiv Malkis, according to you, Rav, Rav Chizda. Bishlema says, Rabbi Lididi. I hold Hoyl that maybe the Archim will come. And therefore, you're not violating any Molocha in the case of baking on Yontiv on a Friday for Shabbos. Nervous, the Chacham made a Takana that they thought that if you'll start baking on Shab on Yontiv for Shabbos, then to, you know, next time you'll you'll think in your mind that you can you're allowed to bake from Yontiv to Chol which certainly you're not allowed to do. And even though Rabbah says you don't get Malchus in the case 
of baking miyantif lechol, where your express purpose was for chol, it's after you suit yantif, so you're not hungry anymore. So Rabbi says, we can't give you malchus because hoil umikloi liorchim vechazile. But Rabbi is going to agree that you're not allowed to bake from yantif to chol. And if we allow you to bake from yantif to Shabbos, and you might come to bake from Yontif to Chol. And the answer is, the Rabbanan instituted a Takana of Eruv Tafshil. Amalei, so Rav Chisna says to Rabba in self-defense, Midorai said, Tzorchei Shabbos Nasim B'Yontif. This, my friend, is a Gemara in Musech the Eruv. And the Gemara presents a controversy amongst the Tanoim about the status of Yontif on Friday. According to one opinion, he's allowed to set up an Erev Tchumim on Erev Yontif, which will cover him even for Shabbos. According to the other opinion, Nate, he needs a separate Erev Tchumim for every one of these two days. One on Erev Yontif for Yontif, the other on Erev Shabbos for Shabbos. Even though, again, it's 48 hours contiguous. But one mind, the other says, no. One Erev suffices for both days. And the Gemara analyzes why and how. Because Kedusha Achasi. We see Yontif and Shabbos from the perspective of Kedusha Yom as a 48-hour indivisible unit of time. And that's called Kiddush Achas. So therefore, Rav Chizda says that Yesh L'chalek, let's differentiate between a person who's baking on Yontif for Chol as opposed to a person who's baking on Yontif Friday for Shabbos. In the case of baking for Yontif on Shabbos, it's Kiddush Achas. And therefore, he's allowed to bake on Yontif for Shabbos, even according to me, says Rav Chizda. I reject oil. And I'm not anticipating any archim, but nevertheless, there's no problem of baking on Yontif for Yontif, and there's no problem of baking on Yontif for Shabbos, which comes next, because in this case, it's Kedush Achas. So in effect, you're baking for Yontif. Now you have to ask, so if you're allowed to bake on Friday on Yontif for Shabbos, so why did the Rabbanan Institute this entity, this enterprise called Erev and the answer is Rabbanu de Gazar Bey, Gzera Shemiyomru, Ofi Miyantif Lechol. If you're going to allow the Doraisa Heter to apply and people are baking on Yantif for Shabbos without an Eru, because the Torah law allows that, says Rav Chiz, it's all Kedush Achas, he may come to bake from Yantif to Chol. And the Rabbanan said, hold on a minute. I'm not going to let you bake on Friday for, for, for Shabbos. No, no, no. I can't allow that because you'll mistakenly come to the conclusion that you're allowed to bake on Yontif for Chol. What I will allow you is to make an Erev Tavshilin. Once you make an Erev Tafshilin and he's not allowed to bake on Yontif for Shabbos without it, that serves as a reminder, as a hekera, that only under this very uh, circumscribed circumstance, it's very restricted in which you have Yontif and then a Shabbos, so Erev Yontif, you make an Erev Tafshilin, and that's going to allow you to cook from Yontif to Shabbos. He'll get the message here that only under very strict conditions is he allowed to bake from Yontif to Shabbos. And that he'll understand that that's a special head there of Kedush HaAchasem that only applies to a Friday of Yontif. But if Yontif falls out on any other day of the week, he knows very well that he's not allowed to bake for tomorrow, meaning for Chol. Because even though the Rabbanan allowed him to bake for Yontif for Shabbos, they only allowed it because they have Tavshilin. So he understands from the message of the Erev Tavshilin that baking from Yontif to Chol is absolutely forbidden. 
and we're only going to allow you to bake from Yom Tov to Shabbos. But when and how? If you make an Erev Tavshin. So again, let's just review what we've what we've learned over here. Rabba objects to Rav Chizda. How can you tell me that in order to get a heter of Malach and Yont, it's got to be Lutzorch Osayom, and therefore if he bakes from Yontif to Chol, he gets Malchus for that. How are we going to allow him to bake from Friday to Shabbos? That's not Lutzorch Osayom. He's not eating it on Yontif. And if you'll tell me, well, we have an air of Tavshilin, that's not going to cut the mustard. You can't tell me that the Rabbanon enacted a Takana, which will be Matir, a Molochet Raisa. That's outside of the purview and the authority of the Chachamim. So how does Erev Tavshilin allow me to bake from Yontif to Shabbos? The answer is Kiddush Achas. Rav Chizda holds that the 48 hours of Friday Shabbos are one continuous Kedusha and therefore there's no Easter to bake on Yontif for Shabbos. The only problem is that people might not realize that this is a special hit there of baking for the sake of Shabbos. How do we convey and, and convince ourselves that they won't make this mistake but rather understand that this is a special hit there that only applies in the case of Yontif to Shabbos because of the principle of Tushachas, that's where they enacted for this purpose and this goal, the heir of Tavshil. The heir of Tavshil will, it will in a profound way transmit the message to the people that this is a special heter that we allow you to cook from Yontif to Shabbos and only under these conditions that you set up an heir of Tavshil. That's going to stave off the mistaken impression that people walk away with that there's no need to bake for the sake of Yontif, I can bake for the sake of Chol, because you allow me to bake for the sake of tomorrow, which is Shabbos. Oh, no, no, no. There were very serious restrictions and conditions that were placed on the person who wants to bake from Yontif to Shabbos. Isve, Rab again comes back to ask a kasha on Rav Chizda. We have a Mishnah in Mesech to Beitza, Behema Mesukenes. Now watch what's going on over here. Shrita on Yantiv, for the sake of Yantiv, meaning you need the basa to eat it, is mutter. It's a Moleches Ochelnef. It's no less than baking or cooking. But now, He's not hungry. He doesn't need any meat. He's got more than an abundance of meat to eat on Yontif. But never he has this kranka, this kranka behemoth. And if he doesn't check this animal, he will suffer a tremendous financial loss because the animal will pay her and it becomes an avail. So the question now is, would we allow him to shech this behemoth misukenes on Yontif, knowing full well that he gets no benefit from the meat of this animal that he's slaughtering, other than the fact that he spares himself a tremendous financial loss. And the Mishnah says, Lo yishchot. he's not allowed to shech it just like this. Ella, unless we're only going to allow him to slaughter this behemoth of Sukenis if he's going to be able to eat at least a kezayis. The Gemara calls it sli, meaning he'll take a kezayis of this bosar and he will fry it, he will roast it, and he's got roast meat. And all this he's going to do while there's still light out, in other words, on Erev, on Erev Yontiv. And we see clearly 
that Afa Gavdalo Boy Lemechel, even though he already finished his Sudas Yantif, he's up to here with meat. You know, he can't take another piece of meat. Nevertheless, he's allowed to shech this, this animal, this misukenis. Says Rabbi Bishlein, this Mishnah can make sense according to my, my premises, my principles. The Amri Hoil. So even though, again, he finished his Suda and he has no intention whatsoever of eating meat, but you never know. Hoil. Hoil vi boil a mechal. Matzi ochi. What does this mean? We don't know that he's going to eat, but there is a possibility that he might eat. And if he wants to eat, he might eat actually a kezayis of basutzli from this animal that he's shechting now. Is mishum hachi yishchot. Therefore, we can permit him to implement the shechita, and it's not a molechas yantiv because he's doing it for the sake of ochel nefesh. I he has no intention to eat from the meat. But we're going to say hoil, hoil. Since if he wanted to eat the meat, he'd be allowed to do so. Right, and if he needed the meat, he'd be allowed to shech. So we're going to say that maybe, perhaps, in a theoretical world, he may need the meat. But Elolididach, according to Yurav Chizda. The Amrit, your position was low Amrit and Hoil. We're not going to say, well, you know what? Maybe Archim will come, or maybe he'll get an appetite and he wants to eat more meat. It's a my Yitzchak. Why would they be so permissive to allow him to shecht a behavior of a Sukkenes? Really, Shalom at Sarkyantu. I'm a lay, so if Chizda gives what I call a very lame answer, and that is, Mishum Hefseid Momono. If he doesn't shech the animal, it's going to pay her, it's going to die, and he only stuck with his uh, carcass and a Nobody wants his nevela. Therefore, he wants to shech it and eat its meat, and he's going to save himself by doing so a tremendous financial loss. What kind of an answer is that? I think this answer of Rav Chiz is even worse than the previous answer of Erev Tavshil. We're going to allow him to shecht an animal on Yontif, which is one of the Lamentes Molochos. And why? Because of Hefseid Mama? Says Rabba, the Chimi Shum Hefseid Mama Sharina Nisur Do Raisa? You know, when you have an Isid Rabbanon, sometimes the Rabbanon on may kill. They'll rely on something in order to prevent you from a tremendous financial loss. But to allow you to violate an Issa Doraisa, a Malacha here, a Malacha Shechita, simply to, pre to prevent a loss, that's impossible. Again, it's outside of the realm to flex the for the Rabbana to flex their muscles and allow you to violate an Issa Doraisa for the sake of Hefse Mama. So Rav Chizda responds to Rabba in the Heter is Mishum Hefse Mama. The Baal Bahama knows that he's not Allah Shech this animal Shalol Sarah Achila Biyantiv. And therefore, the Shum Hefseid Mamon, Gomar Bolibo, Lechel Kezayis, and the Efshel Kezayis below, Shechita. The Rabbanan is saying that he understands he's in a quandary. He has two options. Either he declares, look, I'm full. I can't get another piece of Bosar down my, down my throat. I'll bar from it. Well, in that case, I'm sorry, sir. You're going to suffer a very big financial loss. This animal is going to die. You're not allowed to shift it. Or if he's a little bit more intelligent, 
he will make a decision that he will in fact eat at least the kezayis to set up an achila of this basar of the sukkenis. So that Mishum have said Mama, and he's motivated to gomar belibo to make an absolute decision. The lecho kezayis to eat a kezayis basa. Ah, now he has no way of eating that kezayis basa on yontif unless he checks the animal. So the shechita now becomes the tzor chol nefesh, even though you'll argue that ninety nine percent of the animal. You know, the other 99 kizasim of the basar, he has no need for it. He's going to eat that on chol. But nevertheless, since he cannot get a heter of achil at all without shechita, the shechita now becomes a shechita l'tzor chol nefesh. Now, this touches on an issue which is called marve b'shiurim. Just on a very superficial level, when you have a pot of meat that's cooking. Let's say, for example, you have a chola shiyesh mo sakon. So you're allowed to cook on his behalf. He only needs one pound of meat. And you want to add another pound because why not? You know, I can, you know, once I'm already doing one mice of bichel, which I'm allowed to do for the chola, he's a chola shiyesh mo sakon. Why not use that one mice of bichel to add whatever I need for uh, for my pseudo shlishes on top, you know what I mean, or whatever the case may be. So that's a violation of marba bishiur. So if I'm not allowed to add to the pot and the tavshil that I'm cooking on Shabbos, let's take that example above and beyond what I absolutely need for the pikuach nefesh of so and so. Then I violated the Easter of Marbe Bishiurim. So, why am I allowed, according to Rav Chizda, to shecht an animal that's humongous? Well, I don't know. It's a Misukenis. Maybe it's a, 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 it's one of those poros of Parshas Mikates, the poros rose, but, but a skinny, lame dog. But in any event, what do I need? I need one kezayis. I made a decision. I'm going to eat one single kezayis. So isn't this a violation of Marba B'shiurim? The answer is nay. That's not Marba B'shiurim. Marba B'shiurim applies to Malachas Bichol because with every single piece, every ounce of meat that you add to the pot, that's not within the necessity of Sakana, there's a mice of Bichol on that piece of meat. But in Shechita, the shechit is not on pieces of meat. The shechit is on the animal as a whole. And if I can't get to eat, the, my goal to eat one kezayis below shechita, then the shechit as a whole becomes one maisa malach, which is l'tzar chayo. And therefore, Rav Chizda, Rav Chizda permits. Okay, then, Rav Oksai, so let's just make a note of where we got up to for today. We're on Daf Mem Vav and Beis, and we're up to and this is going to be another kasha that uh, that Rav Huna is going to raise as an objection to to Rav Chizda. And um, as I think I mentioned to you, but uh, it bears repetition. Uh,